Well, welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today our topic is telemedicine, its role beyond COVID. And we're privileged to have Dr. Vineeth Jason from CMC Ludhiana in India speaking to us on this subject. So uh, welcome to everybody from all over the world. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Vineeth Jason. And uh, Dr. Jason is currently working as an associate professor in neurology at Christian Medical College and Hospital in Ludhiana, uh, India. He did his undergraduate, postgraduate and neurology training at CMC Ludhiana, and he grew up in a family of missionary doctors. During his postgraduate neurology training, he set up a physician assistant program for task shifting, highly skilled yet repetitive procedures to address the shortage of doctors. And he's also worked very closely with Dr. Pandian, who's currently the vice president of the World Stroke Organization and has developed through that a keen interest in public health. So this background lays the foundation for Dr. Jason to see the value in telemedicine now as a qualified neurologist. And recently he, along with colleagues at Ludiana, initiated and implemented an institutional telemedicine program with over 70 consultants and 30 specialties, which has been a huge blessing for patients during the COVID time. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Venice Jason to speak to us on telemedicine, its role beyond COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Um, it's my privilege to be here and to participate in this webinar. So today's talk uh, is telemedicine and its role beyond COVID. Um, COVID has, in a way, unified the whole world with a unique experience of being locked down and also with an experience of uh, shared experiences with uh, being alone in the house and being quarantined. Um, I'm not sure these experiences have been pleasant, um, but definitely it has given us something that we will remember for many years to come. Telemedicine also has uh, taken off as a tool during this time period. And I would like to speak about it in this time and also uh, how it is going to play out beyond COVID. In 2017, uh, there was a, a statistical analysis that was done looking at the burden of disease uh, by cause, which affected disability adjusted life years, which is basically calculated by the total burden of disease, both from years of life lost due to premature death and years lived with a disability. And here we find in the graph on the left that the main uh, causes are cardiovascular diseases, cancers, you have neonatal disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, mental and substance use disorders, and other non-communicable diseases. And uh, this has been an interesting change and shift from what was uh, there almost 30 years ago, where we see that uh, infectious or communicable diseases, maternal and neonatal and nutritional disorders were the most common uh, type of uh, uh, disease that was prevalent. And however, as time has gone on and here we are today, we find that non-communicable diseases seems to be the predominant contributor to disability adjusted life years. And that is uh, significant because uh, even in terms of healthcare and the capacity to provide these services um, to patients distant from us, it makes a lot of uh, significance. This here is a chart on the left where we see the uh, main contributor by region for these disability adjusted life years. And we find not surprisingly that the areas that are more affected by them are uh, areas which are economically also challenged and backward. For example, the sub-Saharan African region, and we find uh, also Asia and some parts of uh, South America. And here we find uh, another chart on the right, which almost mirrors the same distribution. 
And that is a chart uh, which is taken from the New England Journal of Medicine, which shows the global supply of health professionals. Interestingly, the, the number of doctors, nurses, and midwives for 10 million population, it's a little old chart uh, from 2011, but it shows that the global health force workforce is grossly low in these particular regions. And that is very important for us, especially um, when we are talking about uh, telemedicine and how do we make this challenge? How do we meet this challenge? So we come to telemedicine and telemedicine is something that uh, the World Health Organization is also very keenly interested in. And they have defined telemedicine as the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases and injuries, research and evaluation, and for the continuing education of healthcare providers, all in the interest of advancing the health of individuals and their communities. The four elements that are germane to telemedicine are that it stands to provide clinical support and it is intended to overcome geographical barriers and connecting users who are not in the same physical location. It also involves the use of various types of information and communication technology and its goal is to improve health outcomes. Telemedicine is not a new concept. It is not something that is uh, uh, of recent origin. And we know that even the mid to late 19th century, there was some form of telemedicine available through the use of telephones. Or in the early 20th century, however, the first documented use of telemedicine was when ECG was transmitted across telephone wires. And a modern shape of telemedicine as we know it today began in the 1960s in the United States and a large push was from the space technology and from military, where there were a lot of experimental work done to see how uh, this transpires. And telemedicine today, as we know it, has, uh, has become globally available in recent years, especially in this year of 2020. What has contributed significantly to this change? Um, one would be that analog machines have been replaced by digital machines. This has definitely enabled transmission of information through uh, digital uh, methods much more easier and increase affordability of such machines. A few years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed of being able to communicate, do our internet, also do uh, computer work with a handheld device like a mobile phone. And even if it was, we would have thought this would be extremely expensive. But today with uh, technology becoming affordable and within the reach of common man, uh, telemedicine definitely is becoming a possibility. Telecommunications, the whole internet boom and the impetus that is being given by the World Bank to have uh, telecommunications available to every person on the planet has also made it very uh, very, very possible for us to use um, telemedicine and making it available to the common man. Also, the uh, development of multimedia, where image and video transfer has become so fast. Earlier on, we used to have very low uh, transmission of information across telephone wires, but now we used to talk of 2G, now even 5G network in certain parts of the world is available, and that reach is spreading. It is increasing every day. In the world today, we know our population stands at 7.81 billion people. And the use of unique mobile phone users is 5.20 billion with a penetration of almost 67%. And internet users are 4.66 billion. And active social media users are around 4.14 billion. Now, this is uh, a staggering statistic, which tells us on how connected the world is today, as opposed to in the years past. And a large majority of people spend a lot of time 
on their mobile phones and use uh, data on their mobile phones. In India, we have uh, data which says that, you know, 70% of the population are living in rural areas and almost 50% of the telephone subscribers as of January 2020 were from rural India. And uh, that is again very significant, especially when we think of the reach of digital uh, information that is available to the rural population of India. Yes, the urban has it in a much better proportion, but even rural parts of India is also increasingly using mobile phones and telecommunications and the internet. On the right here, you see a graph, which is a very fascinating graph, which shows us the household amenities. And if you are likely to be uh, richer if you have access to tap water. And here you have the color coded quintiles. And let us look at the gray quintile, which is the bottom 20% of the household. And here you find that the households may not have tap water. They may, have, may not have toilets within their premises. However, they may have, they have a high likelihood of them having mobile phones. Now, this also makes a very interesting observation as to the reach that we can have to people who may be from the bottom quintile, uh, but have access to mobile phones and healthcare can definitely be uh, improved uh, by accessing and, uh, this technology. This is a graph that I got from, um, uh, from the World Bank. Uh, there's a, a connecting through broadband, a strategy for doubling connectivity by 2021 and reaching universal access by 2030. And here you can see the plans that are there for Africa, for plans to lay underlying undersea fiber optic cables and terrestrial fiber of which are live and some are under construction. So, and the growth uh, that we can see of the use of broadband penetration from 2010 to 2018, it's, an, it's a remarkable progress of, of connectivity that has, been, that has happened in the last few years and which opens the door for telecommunications through video internet, through telephone, through social media, for us to reach a population that previously was physically very difficult to reach due to various reasons. Now, coming on to telemedicine, what are the various ways that we could describe telemedicine? So there are four main ways that telemedicine is described. First is through the mode of communication. We can do telemedicine through audio, video, text, or even email. The timing of information transmitted. We can have telemedicine, which is done live. Uh, something like what we are doing right now is live. And uh, which is called synchronous transmission of information, or it could be asynchronous, which means it is relayed, stored, interpreted, and then responded to at a later date. The third type is the purpose of the consultation, where the telemedicine is used for an emergency consult, or if it is a first consult, the first time patient is presenting to a doctor and using telemedicine as the means to approach the doctor, or as a follow-up consult where the doctor knows the patient, has the patient records because the patient has previously consulted him either through telemedicine or through an in-person consult. And this is a follow-up on that particular uh, consult. And the fourth way is by the interaction between the individuals involved, whether it is a direct patient to the registered medical practitioner or a caregiver, the registered medical practitioner, or even the registered medical practitioner to another medical, uh, registered medical practitioner. The previous model, which you know we are all familiar with, which has been the standard way of operating uh, in our regions, has been that there is a patient who is accessed uh, by healthcare workers, and um, at the most he has access to a primary healthcare center. And uh, if, his, if his disease cannot be handled by the primary healthcare center, he's then referred to the secondary healthcare center, who then would refer the patient to the tertiary healthcare center. And uh, this process would take time. 
it would take effort it would take a series of consultation and a system has been built around this for years together but now with the access to telemedicine and access to technology the patient is empowered to be able to consult whomever he would please he can consult his healthcare worker he can choose to consult a doctor in the primary healthcare center which is near to his house or the secondary healthcare center where he may have followed up previously or even a tertiary healthcare center with specialists the patient now is empowered to choose uh, what he would like to do and the delay between the consultation process is significantly reduced and uh, the choice now rests with the patient to a great extent as to what level of care he would like to have there are four main models uh, of interaction uh, that takes place using telemedicine so the first model is uh, doctor to doctor consult which we do find very often uh, we do consult um, a, a specialist as a doctor primary health care doctor i might want to consult my uh, specialist in a tertiary care hospital to discuss the case of a patient and i can use various modalities to do that either telephone or email or i can uh, use a video chat facility similarly there is a patient to doctor consult which interestingly has picked up significantly in the last um, few months where the patient approaches the doctor directly and uh, for this there are several requirements that the patient should be able to use technology well and the doctor should be familiar with the technology and there is information that is transmitted across um, but this is a model that is rapidly growing the third model is the health healthcare worker to the doctor now this model has a lot of value especially when we are looking at rural outreach areas remote areas which has got access to internet and the healthcare worker who may not be a qualified doctor but is trained to gather data can visit people's homes and transmit that data back to the doctor either live or it can be done asynchronously and improve health outcomes in that patient and that community as such and there is a fourth model where a patient may not be in a position to communicate with the doctor so it's the caregiver who is at the bedside who may be a family member or a, a hired caregiver who can communicate with the doctor the patient's condition and improve health outcomes in the patient now is telemedicine effective you know what do we gain does it really matter should we invest in telemedicine is this something that um just is just there during covid time or is something that is here to stay well let's discuss cost of telemedicine one thing about uh, cost of telemedicine is that there is an initial cost infrastructure cost which is a one time investment for the infrastructure however over a period of time uh, the recurring costs are so low that uh, it is distributed across patients that it becomes very affordable for people and uh, and the, the the behavior of the patients is that they are opting for this mode of uh, consultation what about time previously patients used to have to travel a uh, significant distance now be it even from the neighborhood to come to the hospital register themselves they had to sit in the waiting line in the opd in the outpatient areas wait for that turn with the doctor and then wait for the prescription go to the pharmacy stand in line all of these things were acceptable a few months or a few years ago but now with uh, society having moved so much online patients impatient uh, nature is also coming forth where they are not willing to wait for very long and it saves a lot of time now this is not just for the affluent population even the patients who are daily wage workers for them to sit and wait in an opd it is a whole day's wage that they lose which can be easily converted into a consult online and uh, and, and that saves their time it saves the effort uh, of going to the hospital and they are able to do it from their own convenience at their own time what about access to expertise now expertise is uh, has been an issue uh, that has been 
uh, quite a prevalent problem because of um, specialists not being available in rural and remote parts of the world. Now with telecommunication, it is so easy to access this expertise uh, and give good uh, consultations for patients who may need them. And uh, travel, like I addressed, patients don't need to spend money on travel. Uh, we have patients who come five hours, they come by taxi, they spend a lot of money and time, almost a day to come and consult us in person. Now these people are able to consult us through telemedicine and they have found it to be very useful. Uh, safety. Now, in uh, COVID times, definitely safety has become an issue. However, even apart from that, uh, the safety of bringing debilitated patients from their homes where they may be staying on the first floor or the second floor, bringing without a lift, bringing them down, bringing them to the hospital, having them wait in the hospital premises, um, does put them at risk. And uh, also traveling in the roads, if you're traveling for long hours, if you're going by car, vehicular accidents, all of these things definitely can be avoided. And coming to uh, economies of scale, when we see uh, this particular tool, there's a tremendous uh, uh, potential for us to scale it up to reach a large population. If there is a parallel growth of the number of doctors available, on the other hand, willing for consultations and which would drive down the cost and make this even more affordable. What about quality? Do we have evidence to say that telemedicine is as good as an in-person as an in-person consultation? Well, there are several papers out there. Uh, I have just put a few um, uh, in stroke in our area because my center here is a stroke center. Uh, we have found this to be very effective to be able to triage patients using stroke, uh, using te uh, telemedicine. Before telemedicine, we were using simple tools like WhatsApp. Even now, we use it often for ease of communication within the department and within consultants. And uh, we are using it, though, although it may have been in an informal way. But there are several papers which have shown uh, about the effectiveness of telestroke or tele-MI, which helps us to be able to uh, utilize this effectively. And, um, and you can use it in the emergency situation. We can use it in the, um, you know, for pulmonology, for rural population, delivery of pulmonary care. We can use it for uh, myocardial infarction to triage patients by looking at ECGs by an expert which can be sent across um, the communication devices. So it is definitely uh, valuable. Even in uh, diseases where we would expect that, uh, you know, there's a lot of hands-on uh, required uh, for us to be able to care for these patients. There are significant uh, information out there which tells us even physical and medical rehabilitation, how telehealth has helped reach populations which were previously not um, you know, accessible to rehabilitation. And there are several papers I would ask you to refer to this one, if you could, uh, after this talk. In COVID, you know, there has been this uh, tremendous emphasis on social distancing, which has trapped many people from being able to access healthcare. And social distancing has become a new normal where people are avoiding coming to the hospital, avoiding meeting um, health professionals. And that has uh, had a tremendous impact on the health of many people. Patients who have had epilepsy, uh, not being able to continue their anti-epileptic drugs because of several uh, blockage in supply of medicines or in terms of uh, access to prescription because these drugs are not over-the-counter medicines. So those things have also become quite significant. But uh, we were very uh, fortunate that India passed a telemedicine uh, guideline, the Medical Council of India on 25th of March. And that has given a lot of impetus to our nation to use telemedicine for helping patients in, in such situations. And teleconsulting became the only feasible option available for us to reach out to patients. 
which has caused a sudden surge of interest all across our country and uh, in our institution as well. And several innovative models uh, emerged even through this pandemic. Well, our story began in 2018, uh, in October, when there was this concept and a colleague of mine was keen uh, to look at whether we can use telemedicine as a research tool to access and train healthcare workers in the field. And um, in, in, in March of uh, 2020, 2019 is when I took over and we explored several different aspects of uh, uh, telemedicine, different models of telemedicine, as I mentioned previously. But in uh, 2020 March, it, it suddenly uh, got a boost, which was the COVID boost. And um, we implemented this and we accessed a third party software and we implemented telemedicine and were able to get on a majority of our consultants to come on board and to see the value of what we were offering them. And uh, in today where we stand, we've nearly done over a thousand teleconsults successfully. And, uh, and that has been uh, a very encouraging uh, change that has happened. Well, our current model is uh, to use a telemedicine team at the center. These are mainly people who are telecallers. They form the connection between the patient, the doctors in CMC, and the third party vendor, the software, because that needs to be constantly engaged and updated. So the telemedicine team calls up uh, patients uh, or, and they also train the doctors. They also, uh, if there are any issues that were to come up, they interact with the third party vendor software. And if you would to look at the kind of consults that we have had, We've had a lot of consults in the cancer specialty, hemato-oncology. We have a bone marrow transplant program here. So many patients, because they were immunocompromised, weren't able to come to the hospital. So they uh, gladly moved on to this uh, tool that was made available to them. Also, neurology was a specialty that has, uh, again, uh, probably I would say because of uh, people who saw the value of this were able to uh, take on this head on and have been able to utilize this tool well. Also for mental health, you know, uh, uh, it's a fantastic tool to use where we don't need to do too much of clinical examination and psychiatry is a, a specialty like that. And they have been able to do several consults uh, successfully uh, through this. So what did we do or what are we doing now? We generate awareness in patients and their caregivers through phone calls, through the outpatient department, we do notices, even the doctors counsel patients, especially the debilitated ones who cannot travel. And the telemedicine team then handholds the patient and the doctor for the teleconsult because it's a new technology tool and many doctors are not tech savvy and they take time to learn. And patients especially also need to be taught on how to use uh, this particular platform. And the patients then select the doctor or the specialty, they book a consult and uh, they book the date and time and they transfer the payments online. The doctor then confirms the appointment. He has the freedom to shift the appointment to suit his convenience. And uh, an SMS and an email alert of the booking is sent to both the doctor and the patient and also a reminder. And for initiating the consult, both log in to this particular platform and then they have a video consult with proper documentation of the entire consult and the video is also recorded. This is uh, the, 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 when the patient would log in, this is the screen that they would see. And if they were to look at uh, search for doctors, then they would, uh, each patient is given an, a specific login ID uh, and the doctors also have their own separate login ID. Then you would search for doctors and the list of doctors opens up and they can choose each doctor and go and book online and uh, select the doctors and schedule themselves. At the start of the telemedicine consultation, if it is a first consult, then uh, of course the patient needs to be uh, interviewed in detail. So the patient's identification and consent is taken verbally and uh, patient's ID is checked, the name, age, address, his email ID is confirmed and consent is implied, of course, if the consult was initiated by the patient 
In emergency, we can do a quick assessment. I will probably show very briefly some tools that can be used for emergency consultation. The exchange of information that is done has to be uh, for relevant information. And also if it is inadequate, the doctor reserves the right to ask for more clarity. And if satisfied, he can offer his professional opinion. But if it is not appropriate and he feels that uh, for further teleconsult, that he needs to come for an in-person consultation, then he can do a health education and advise the patient for an in-person consult. Various things that are available to the doctor are to provide health education, counseling, specific to the clinical indication, and he can advise investigations. He can provide specific treatment by prescribing medicines. There is a guideline issued by our government, uh, the Medical Council of India, on what all the prescriptions should contain. And also they have given us a guideline as to what type of uh, medicines can be prescribed on a, a first person consultation or a, a follow-up consultations. Which are the drugs which cannot be prescribed on teleconsulting? And uh, this also, however, was challenged because like I said, epilepsy patients were really struggling uh, with non-availability of anti-epileptic drugs. And that there has been an addendum to this uh, a few months later. There is also a second model that is available here at CMC. And this has to do with, of course, uh, care that some affluent patients might demand where they would like to consult doctors in, uh, in, in high income countries. So we have a tie up with Cleveland Clinic where a patient can come to CMC and he can have a CMC doctor uh, evaluate him and consult a doctor live at Cleveland Clinic and give him uh, uh, an opinion uh, for patient satisfaction and for difficult cases can be discussed through this platform and improve health outcomes here at our setting. Of course, uh, all of this comes uh, with a word of caution for both the doctors and for the patients. And it is very important for the doctors that you should check the identity of the person across the screen. Uh, it's very important, uh, especially for medical legal issues uh, we need to be very careful and cautious. Even as we try to do good, there are people who would want to abuse it. So uh, go through all the reports carefully. Uh, try and be dressed professionally. Uh, document as many of the facts as you can. Uh, this is where we encourage us, uh, everyone to do video recording of every consult uh, as far as possible. Uh, that helps in documenting in itself. And uh, we need to display our license number clearly. Uh, you know, examination of body parts which are sensitive should be avoided uh, to be done live. And if at all, we should advise them to send pictures which will imply consent. And examination of minors should be done only when the parents are present. Now for patients, it is always advisable to upload as much information before the consult and also to be breast, dressed appropriately, uh, express your complaints clearly, and keep your ID proof ready at all times and, uh, and take good quality pictures with good lighting for a better opinion on skin lesions, uh, which is also a dominant uh, uh, specialty that is requested. Looking at the potential for telemedicine in global health. Uh, this is a paper from the Harvard Medical School, uh, which talks about uh, the need for a multi-pronged interdisciplinary approach and uh, especially to look at research into effective and sustainable models of telemedicine. Um, and this is going to be very key in the time to come. And this is where I feel, uh, you know, uh, Christians in medicine and in dental specialities would be able to contribute the most you know, why should we get involved in this? Well, it is effective, it is efficient, and it is a new normal. You'll be surprised that patients are also demanding and expecting us to be able to use this facility. Uh, you know, it, the reach to the remotest parts, and like I mentioned, there is a huge impetus by the World Bank to be able to digitize uh, as many people as possible, and the governments of the various nations are also uh, supporting that and uh, or, or leading it. The poorest also have access to technology today in some form. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, the poor may not have a toilet, they may not have access to tap water, 
but they have access to mobile phones and that has driven being driven by affordability also it is efficient and uh, minimal expenses for infrastructure and uh, for us we have had to invest almost uh, nothing in infrastructure because most of our data is on the cloud and each doctor has their own uh, devices the patients have their own devices so um, except for of course the team that is there our uh, initial investment has been uh, very very minimal and in missions you know for primary care multiple healthcare workers in the field can go with a device of course internet connectivity is important and they can consult live with the main hospital emergency care can be provided to patients and paramedics at site with devices uh, we can transmit ecg vital signs videos of patients uh, you know even specialized care consultant to consultant anywhere in the world now it doesn't need to be restricted to our own country it can be done uh, to a different country uh, healthcare worker to a consultant again anywhere in the world coming on to briefly uh, on history taking when we are seeing patients has to be uh, high quality and high standard as in for an in person consult and there are these examination tips that can be used it's called the 10 uh, signs for tele telehealth Uh, how to look at vital signs skin assessment head eyes ear nose and throat evaluation neck lungs heart abdomen extremities neurological and you'll be surprised that even for neurological examination there are uh, various uh, tools that are available for uh, doing virtual neurological examination how to assess the cranial nerves motor system examination sensory findings coordination gait and of course the expanded mental status examination so all of these things are available and much more uh, uh, for us to be able to utilize this tool well in the days to come i would like to end with this uh, when we look at the need in the world especially um, in areas where there is no access to uh, healthcare you know i remember i remember the words of jesus where he had asked he told his disciples to feed the 4000 and he said that you feed them and the disciples said it's not possible for us to feed them how do we do that and he asked them how many loaves do you have or what do you have and i think uh, there is a lot that we have at our disposal for us to be able to do what uh, god wants us to do and to meet the need that is around us thank you well wasn't that absolutely amazing uh, presentation it, it certainly blew my mind listening to it all and uh, some of the comments coming through on the chat were were uh, incredibly complimentary but well, one person just said they that they were exploding with all the ideas that they could use in their own practice and you've really opened this up to us beautifully not just shown and demonstrated so clearly what the need is but but shown us the big picture of how medicine technology is changing how covid has acted as the catalyst to make this possible but then especially outlining the steps you've taken at ludiana to turn these dreams into reality as well uh, it's been incredibly uh, inspiring and practical as well and then for the spiritual challenge at the end to bring this to the poorest to the poor in the most remote situations we see so clearly the relevance for a healthcare mission so we're moving now into a time of of questions and uh, the first one comes from Marissa Resolta in the Philippines who said given the advantages you've mentioned in conducting telemedicine what are the disadvantages you've encountered you touched a little bit on this but are there any legal implications for the practice of telemedicine in order to protect both the healthcare provider and the patient Uh, you you mentioned some of the, the the things to uh to mitigate against abuse but uh, perhaps you could talk more about that the the difficulties and disadvantages you've encountered and how you've overcome them i think the disadvantages definitely are in clinical examination uh you know our standard treat teaching is to always evaluate a patient um of course with observation very high emphasis is paid on our observatory skills but also palpation is something that is uh, important or a part of it 
and uh, that is something that is as of now not actively uh, engaged in there is a lot of work happening to be able to do that also in the future uh, using technology but uh, you know that these things are going to evolve so one disadvantage definitely is clinical examination but there are ways to uh, go around that uh, where we have used uh, the help of uh, the relatives to examine patients for us if there are certain things that uh, if there is a point that is tender or there are other issues there we can ask them um, now i would also want to mention that we encourage more patients to use it for follow up consults so uh, that is very important first consult we do use it but uh, you know often we do end up calling them into the clinic for a detailed examination so uh, i wouldn't encourage people to give that is why even in the prescriptions that i showed you the legal uh, permissions we do not have permission to give many prescription drugs on a first consult basis only on a follow up basis can we give uh, many of the drugs that patients would require uh, apart from that for the safety of the doctor uh, it is very important that we use a tool that is uh, that can record the communication in fact the communication is much better recorded through telemedicine than through an in person consult because the conversations we have with our patients have so much of information that is uh, uh, communicated but none of that gets documented somehow you know we we summarize them but in this telemedicine we are able to record the entire conversation and uh, store it for later legal use which can be retrieved and uh, you know it saves the doctor uh, but these are things that will evolve and uh, there are legal implications i'm glad in our country Uh, there is a, a a huge push by the government for doctors to use telemedicine so there is some degree of uh, guidelines that have come out and within those guidelines i think there's a lot that can be done yes. you're on mute sorry for, for physical examination is it possible for two doctors to be working in tandem perhaps say a family medicine practitioner general practitioner in a rural clinic working together with a with a specialist in a tertiary center uh, where where one the doctor on site could do the examination yes i think that is a, a, that's a very good point and uh, like i said that there are these four models you know of a doctor to doctor or a healthcare worker to doctor whether you know you can even imagine uh, using pharmacists uh, to a great extent to use your program to extend it into the rural parts where uh even dispensing drugs can be done so the examination parts we can use workers in the healthcare field who are going into these areas with some basic degree of training uh which can be uh tuned to the needs of telemedicine and they can you know uh, meet these patients examine them use torch light examination simple tools of course these tools are becoming more sophisticated uh i would like to mention you know to telehealth stethoscopes e stethoscopes there are e ophthalmoscopes e otoscopes there's a lot of a uh, lot of expansion happening in this and uh, and it will become affordable soon like everything else it will also become fairly within the range of uh, uh, the poor yes everything's getting cheaper any thoughts on how uh, tally surgery uh, tally dentistry what role could could it have uh, so or, i have uh, this... i haven't put it up but there's a paper on uh, dental and oral hygiene and oral health uh, that is there which has been using telemedicine for that of course uh, you know oral examination will be very limited but people are using that they are transmitting x-rays uh, through this for uh, dental uh, for dentitions and um, that is there even photographs of lesions in the mouth people are able to send it across using telehealth regarding surgery uh, in my experience what has happened has been you know i remember working with a with a friend where uh, while operating he had to consult a senior consultant he was using his telephone to know what is what should he do what's the next step you know he's in the abdomen but he can't find the appendix but uh, what do you do i mean that is a form of telehealth uh in our country that is not legal right now 
but at the same time uh, there is role of robotic surgery now of course these are all uh, very expensive which is using uh, you know through internet you're able to uh, operate in a distant patient in a distant land uh, this is possible and i'm expecting with time these things will not be very expensive and will be available depending on how uh, much we find value in them uh, you know to do these things in the patient population we seek to serve mm. does telemedicine open up the prospect of many more uh, non medically qualified personnel being involved you know med medical or healthcare workers uh, in the remote diagnosis and treatment of conditions? And, and if so, uh, what's the likely impact on the role of the physician going forward? I think the role of physician will not diminish, uh, um, but definitely we will be able to engage many more people who would uh, take it up probably as a business opportunity to be able to reach out to the people uh, to increase access to these physicians who are available. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, like I mentioned, you imagine uh, a village uh, where people do not have access to good diabetic medications or hypertensive medications, which is now the burden, really. Uh, Non-communicable diseases, lifestyle diseases are the burden. And if we are able to uh, encourage people to take it up as a business venture, where we set up pharmacies for them, and they have access to uh, you know, basic uh, medicines, like I said, hypertensive medications, diabetic medications, and they have a telemedicine console where they are access to physicians who may be in the city. And uh, patients can come and get their blood pressure checked, they can get their, their weight checked, they can get, I mean, very simple things tested and get refills from these pharmacies where it's a sustainable thing for the for the businessman or the pharmacist. For the patient, it makes it so much more simpler. Uh, they are able to get their medicines in their own village. And for the doctors, they have access to uh, a larger uh, share of patients, which who otherwise wouldn't be able to reach them. So, uh, you know, these models are already uh, being implemented. Now, uh, Dr. Jason, you, you mentioned the internet Internet of Things, and uh, just looking into the future prophetically, uh, how do you think the Internet of Things is going to impact on medicine and dentistry beyond what you've been talking about? If, if someone to ask you to look into the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I just uh, look at the amount of uh, effort that is being put into um, you know, information there is tremendous amount of information that has exploded with internet. Um, I myself, for one, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to be updated on everything in neurology. And I am heavily dependent on accessing information, which I use internet and I use apps and I use softwares to update me. I clinically examine patients, I come to a diagnosis, but to be current on my management, I always take time to refer to uh, you know, various sources um, to be able to make a good diagnosis. Now, uh, apart from that, apart from information, uh, also the ability to be, uh, to, to be present in a location which is far off from you physically um, is possible now through telemedicine. I mean, literally, if you could just look at our meeting, we are all over the world, but we are communicating as though we are sitting right next to each other across a table. So uh, internet definitely is going to be a dominant part of our lives. And that is why the emphasis the World Bank and uh, various countries are doing to digitize people and to get them onto it. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot that's going to uh, you know, unfold in time to come. Um, was that what you wanted to hear? I mean, I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, now, you, you've mentioned already the possibility of, of uh, field workers uh, uh, working in rural areas or remote areas, but armed with extraordinary uh, technology at the bedside, the reading, temperature, pulse, blood pressure, oxygen, saturation, taking ECGs and so on. What sort of experience does Ludiana have in uh, dealing with that kind of partnership where you've got a, a tech 
technology armed, uh, but not medically trained healthcare worker at the bedside and the doctor available in the hospital or clinic? See, honestly, I want to share the experience of some of my patients. Now, you'll be surprised that there is no healthcare worker there, but these are patients who came with uh, Landry Goulombard disease, LGBS, and uh, you know they were paralyzed uh, from the, the quadriplegic, basically. And because of that, they were on a ventilator for a long time. They were on tracheostomizers. And uh, you know we do recommend our patients to go home we don't have hospices for them to be taken and stepped down. So they provided the patient excellent care at home. These are the family members. And they've got a saturation probe. They check the blood pressure themselves. And they check the temperature themselves. And they communicate with us through telemedicine. <laughs> so uh, that is, of course, this family who could afford it. But if you would look at affordability, a saturation probe in India, you can get it now for around 400 rupees. 400 rupees would be, I mean, less than, I mean, you will have to convert that. That's like really, really uh, affordable, you know, and a blood pressure equipment in India would be around 1000 rupees, 1000 rupees. Um, so managing a patient, a suction machine, you know, which runs on electricity, would cost around 4,000 rupees. If you do it manually, it would come for around 2,000, 2,500 rupees. So you can literally have an intensive care unit at home if you're willing to care for your loved ones. So, uh, so the, the, the spectrum is changing where patients are being managed more at home by their loved ones if they can afford to do this. And healthcare workers going into the field there is a shift in the cities, not so much in rural areas, where people are going into people's homes and caring for them and are able to use this technology. Now, a lot of people are concerned about big data and uh, governments or hospitals, healthcare workers having information about them that they might, that might conceivably be used against them in some circumstance. Do you, do you see a danger in confidentiality being compromised or in patients being exploited from the, the inappropriate use of this kind of technology? Could you speak into yes. that? Yes, yes. I, I, there is always that danger and that danger cannot be ignored, which is why when we, uh, when we hire a third party vendor, it is important to get into a legal contract with them about data and how this data is going to be protected uh, that's all that we can do as healthcare providers. Really, we do not have access to or the capacity to protect anything more than that. At least uh, from the our uh, legal safety point of view, we should have clear guidelines that the vendor will not share any of that information without the permission of the hospital uh, for any purpose whatsoever. Uh, now that that is a it's a legal understanding and a contract when it is drawn it needs to be made out. Uh, apart from that, uh, there is always a danger. I mean, you know, even in this video consulting on telemedicine, examining patients, which is why I mentioned we have to be very sensitive how we go about it. You know, asking patients to show body parts so that we can see it more clearly. All of these things can be abused if it is not done uh, properly which is why when it is recorded, there is a capacity for the management to do quality checks on those consults and review those consults. So uh, that brings a, a degree of control on what transpires in these, uh, uh, you know, these video consults. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a danger and we should look at uh, you know, whether all of these are being compliant with international standards of uh, data protection. Now, uh, you mentioned a lot about the cost savings. Uh, how, how do people practically pay for a consultation at Ludiana and how much do they pay for the service? Just to give us some idea. Okay. So, uh, well, in Ludiana, what we did was, uh, we looked at several models. Like I said, we spent almost a year looking at different models that we wanted to do. And COVID kind of immediately pushed us into a different uh, frame of mind. Um, so right now I'll tell you what we are doing. We are charging 1000 rupees for a consult. 
uh, now uh, that is definitely more than our in-person consult that happens in our institution. Um, and that is because we would call it this a convenience fee for the patient to be able to communicate with the doctor at his leisure, at his chosen time, and the doctor is available within the institution to meet him. Now, uh, so just 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 for those listening, a uh, thousand rupees is about ten pounds sterling, or about twelve dollars for a consultation. Yes. Sorry, carry on, Doctor Jason. Yes, and that uh, happened because of our negotiations with the with the vendor. So we, if we were able to get, uh, we were interested actually to expand and scale it up. Uh, to a much larger extent. And uh, we do realize that this may be beyond the reach of many of our common patients. But like I said, telemedicine needs to be scaled in both directions from the patient perspective and also from the number of doctors who are using it because a teleconsult normally would take around 20 to 30 minutes to do uh, an effective consultation on telemedicine. And uh, if it's a follow-up patient, you can do it much more faster. But at the same time, uh, we would look at reducing the price when we're looking at scaling it up. Uh, but initially for us to be able to make this whole viable to show that it is uh, not just uh, uh, you know, charity that we are giving, but at the same time, it is uh, uh, bringing in revenue. Uh, we had to prove that this model would work. Uh, so that is why we had priced it at that. Uh, but in future, I think we will definitely be bringing down the prices. And I guess there are creative ways of doing it too. So for example, a church or mission hospital might have a private wing uh, where uh, more well-to-do patients can pay more in order to subsidize treatment for the poor and the marginalized. And I guess that kind of system, once you've got proof of concept and it yeah. well working well, that could be used. We're almost out of time, uh, which is sad because there are many more questions, but just one final question for you. Uh, what do you think about spiritual conversations during telemedicine consultations and, and how would that be different from a bedside consultation or a clinic consultation? Well, I think uh, uh, at least in our country, there is freedom of uh, expression. And uh, we are able to communicate spiritual things because that is a very firm need, you know, and there is evidence that uh, for mental health, especially that uh, spirituality helps. Of course, they have not said what type of spirituality, but in some form, it does help even in uh, addiction and people staying, uh, you know, coming out of addiction, it helps them scientifically, you know. Um, in teleconsult, definitely, like I said, because it is going to be recorded, we need to be careful. But at the same time, uh, I feel, you know, what we truly believe cannot be kept hidden. And it will come out in conversations when we try to help them. And we need to be uh, careful as to where we are practicing and what we are communicating should be to, you know, in whatever sense, of course, to benefit the patient and help them come out of their situation. Well, thank you very much. We've been listening to Dr. Vanith Jason from uh, Christian Medical College, Ludhiana in the Punjab in the north of India, speaking on telemedicine, its role uh, after COVID uh, and beyond COVID and indeed during COVID as you've been demonstrating as well. So thank you so much for opening up our minds to this uh, amazing subject and showing us a, a beautiful best practice model of how you've got it going already and we hope we'll uh, hear much more about it as well. So thank you uh, once again for joining us on ICMDA webinars. We hope you've enjoyed it, been informed and inspired. Tell others about it. Uh, get on our mailing list for future sessions as well. And finally, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jason, for sharing your wisdom with us and inspiring us. Uh, God bless you all and we'll see you hopefully next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.